So the next talk is about Jeremy and, um, and Purple and how they can make it nine times faster than MRI. It's presented by Peter. He works for Oracle Labs and is uh, one of the maintainers of concurrent uh, Ruby Gem. So please welcome him. Thank you. So hello. As was mentioned, I work for Oracle Labs, which is a research group within Oracle. And uh, we work on uh, Graal, Compiler, and uh, Truffle uh, framework there as well. Uh, and I'll be talking about uh, what makes Truffle Ruby run nine times uh, faster than MRI. And uh, we recently changed names from JRuby plus Truffle to just Truffle Ruby. Uh, I would also like to make sure at the beginning that you understand this is a research product. So don't buy any Oracle stocks based on anything you hear uh, here today, even if you like it. So I start uh, talking a little bit about Opcard, what it what it is. Then uh, I uh, explain what Truffle Ruby is, and then I follow with uh, explaining some of the optimizations we do and how we are able to run it uh, run Opcard nine times fast. So. Uh, Opcard is a, a NES emulator, which means the NES is shortcut for Nintendo Entertainment System, which is an old console. Uh, it's, it has a 8 bit CPU uh, and a picture processing unit and uh, 2 kilobytes of RAM and uh, RAM. It was released in 1983, and you can look up the benchmark uh, on GitHub. And it was created to drive the improvements for Ruby 3 to make MRI three, three, uh, three, ta three times faster. And uh, the benchmark itself uh, runs uh, one master game. So uh, let's start by that we have a look, even though the benchmark was not developed primarily for being to play the games, but uh, you can do it anyway. So we can play one master on, uh, this is on MRI, 2.4. You can see it's a little bit laggy, so it takes about 40 seconds before I solve this uh, simple, the first level. So just bear with me for a few more seconds. Uh, almost there. Yeah, you, you can see it's uh, around 13 or 15 frames per second. But if we uh, a little bit more, okay. If we run the same thing on a Truffle Ruby, it will be much better. So, oh sorry, I'll be able to solve the same level in about 20 seconds because just the UI works much nicer. So that's it. Of course, this is not. A, this is very subjective way how to compare the implementations. But I wanted to show you that it's actually you, you can actually play games on Truffle Ruby with Opcard. So let's move on to results. So these are these are the results uh, published on the op, in the Opcard README on GitHub uh, for all the different uh, implementations. They are run un, up, up, up until uh, 180 frames which is not enough for Truffle Ruby to fully warm up. And also the Truffle Ruby is not uh, part of this benchmark of these results. So uh, we've run around. Uh, so I will show you results for these four implementations, MRI uh, 2.0, which is the baseline, uh, the latest one, JRuby with iMonk dynamic enabled and on server. And of course, Truffle Ruby on Graal VM uh, 0.19. And I'll be using uh, 6,000 frames to uh, let it uh, run much longer. So, at first, I've uh, zoomed in uh, 
at uh, the first 600 frames. The x-axis are frames and the uh, uh, y-axis is uh, uh, frames per second. And uh, you can see that the MRI implementations are pretty stable from the beginning. Uh, the 2.4 is slightly faster. The green dots represent samples from uh, JRuby. You can see that it takes a little bit to warm up and that it's stable around uh, 50 frames per second. Truffle Ruby has a longer warm up, but it's because we didn't really look at it yet, so don't take this as a final state, how fast or slow we warm up. But we don't stop at the 50 frames per second, we go up to 110. And if, if we look at the whole graph for 6,000 uh, frames, you can see that uh, Truffle Ruby is uh, is after all the optimizations are done, it go, goes up to 240 frames per second, compared to MRI, which is down around 20 something. So this is the comparison by uh, taking the last 1,000 samples from the previous uh, slide. So let's have a look at the closer look at uh, opt-carrot. So if you uh, profile the code, you can see that there is uh, one really hot method render pixel in the PPU, the pro picture processing uh, unit class. Uh, so we will be looking at its source code. And there is also a group of nodes which are representing the memory mode access, uh, memory mode access and uh, instructions uh, in the CPU class. So we'll be looking at those as well. So this is the source code for the uh, render pixel method from the PPU. As you can see, it does uh, lots of instance variable accesses, some integer operations, and also accesses arrays and uh, appends arrays. So we will be later looking at how we optimize instance variables, for example. Uh, the source code for CPU is not just uh, one method, it's composed for many methods. And uh, uh, there's also a, a constant, the dispatch, which is an array of arrays, which is used to map uh, the opcode, which is just an integer value, to uh, method name and the arguments of the method which should be called for a given opcode. Op so for example, if the opcode is one, then it looks up the first uh, Array, the array in the, in the position one from the dispatch, and it's called with the send method. So it will go to the array op method, and there, there are two other sends where the first one uh, prepares the environment from, for reading from a memory in a given mode, and the second send just uh, executes some of the instructions. So before we go to talk about some of the optimizations specifically, I also explain a little bit uh, generally how Truffle Ruby works. I forgot to mention at the beginning, if you have, uh, if I explain something poorly, please ask immediately, don't wait at the, at the end. So Truffle Ruby is a Ruby implementation uh, we aim to be very highly compatible with MRI, which means that we are, will be able to run C extensions, not just run them, but we will run them as fast as MRI does. Uh, and of course, the aim, aim is performance, as you see in the results. So which also means that there should not be any more uh, need for writing C extensions or, C or Rust extensions, because code you write in a Ruby should be as fast as, almost as fast as if you would write a C extension or, or in Rust or whatever. Uh, the Truffle Ruby implementation is using Truffle, which is a language implementation framework, uh, which is a self-optimizing KST interpreter, and I'll be explaining that. And it uses a Graal compiler to just in time compile the Ruby methods. So I'll start by explaining what's abstract syntax tree. So if you have a simple method foo, uh, you can ex uh, express that as a tree, 
uh, where at the beginning is the call to the to string method. Uh, the left branch goes to the receiver, which is in this case is a call to the plus method on a receiver six with first argument seven, and then the right branch at the top is uh, eight, which is the argument of the to string method. So we can turn this into interpreter very easily by representing each of the nodes with a class. So for example, we start with the, uh, with the, constant, with the literal nodes, with the numbers. So we can implement it just by creating this uh, literal node where it's initialized with the value. And when you call the execute method where you are interpreting the node, it will just return the value which was used to initialize the node. Now let's have a look at the uh, method calls. So now we have to create a node with a little bit more information. We need the name, we need a node which is representing the receiver, and we need an uh, array of nodes which are representing the arguments for the method. So uh, those we assign to instance variables, and then we execute this node. Uh, we first have to execute the receiver node to get the actual object, the receiver. Then we look up the method by name. And then we can call the method with the receiver and uh, with the arguments after evaluating the nodes representing the arguments. But as I said, uh, Truffle is self-optimizing abstract syntax tree interpreter. So if I continue this simple example, uh, we can, for example, uh, do node replacement. So uh, we had, uh, uh, what was it called? We had method call node. So we can do uh, mono monomorphic cache, uh, simple monomorphic cache here, by creating initialized method call node, which when it's first executed, it will look up the method, and then it replaces itself with another node, cached method call node, uh, but there won't be just the name of the method, it will be already the object representing the method to be called. And after it's replaced, it will be immediately called. And if you look at the uh, cached method call node uh, class, we see that uh, in the execute method, the method is Im immediately called. There is no more expensive look lookup of the method through the classes and modules of uh, Ruby. Uh, this is, of course, a very simplified example. I won't be explaining how we do the optimizations and stuff like that, how we deal with uh, when the method is uh, uh, redefined and stuff like that. Of course, we handle that, but uh, I'm skipping a bit. But even though the nodes are specializing for the code they are executing by, for example, doing certain caches and stuff like that, it's not enough to be able to run that fast. So we need to be able somehow to compile this. So for that, we use partial evaluation, which basically eliminates all the overhead uh, of uh, executing the nodes. So uh, we do that by trying to execute as much as we can, because we use all the constant information from the nodes. So if we have a look again at the cached method call node and the return node, uh, we add uh, in this example, uh, attribute final. We will be just assuming for this example that Ruby has final methods, which means, uh, sorry, final instance variables, which means that uh, basically after you set uh, some value to the instance variable, it cannot be, it can't be ever changed, which is important for the partial evaluation. So if we take the, we represent the code from the previous slides uh, with these nodes. And uh, we start to partially evaluating it. So we start by copying the body of the method of the top node for executing the two-string method. But now, because we've marked some of the instance variables as final, we know that the method receiver arguments are final, uh, are constant values during the compilation. So we now can uh, expand that to uh, just the array which contains the one literal node uh, which contains the value 8, 
I am using the brackets here to represent objects which are already created. Um, this is not an instantiation of, a, of that object, it's just a representation of the object which was already stored with the argument instance variable. So now we can get rid of the array. Uh, we can execute uh, the method execute on the return now. And if you remember, it's just a reading of the uh, uh, value instance variable inside the literal node, which is constant. So we can just replace that with eight. Now we will uh, evaluate the receiver. So I do a little substitution here to make it easier. So again, we replace the execute method with the body, body of the execute method on the uh, cache method call node. And uh, again, we replace the arguments with seven. Uh, receiver is in this case is return node for six, so we replace it for six. And the method is uh, again, because it's cache, uh, cache method call node, so the method was already looked up uh, in the initialized node before, so the method is uh, again just the object representing the method itself, so we can replace that with the direct call to the method on the integer class. So we now put that back, and uh, the last thing we have to do is replace the first method, which is the instance variable from the top node, uh, to get uh, just two direct calls. So we've eliminated all the f execute methods of the nodes, and we are left just uh, with the bare minimum we have to do. So this is the compilation unit, basically, which will then is feed fed to uh, Graal compiler. And uh, comp uh, Graal produces highly optimized machine code for this uh, uh, compilation unit. So next time when you call this method, it will not go through the interpreter through calling the execute methods on the nodes, but it will call the compiled code for this. OK, so we actually don't write the Ruby nodes in uh, Ruby. Uh, we use Java for that. So this is a small example from, of our actual implementation of uh, the plus operation of fi on fixnum. We use uh, DSL a lot, which means uh, in Java that we use uh, annotations heavily and annotation processors. So for example, the code on the left just uh, means that for doing plus operation on a, on a fixnum, we have uh, uh, at least these four specializations, where the first one is uh, used for doing uh, addition of two small integers without overflow. If that fails with the arithmetic exception, then the second specialization is used, which uh, casts the values too long to avoid the overflow. If we are adding two longs, then we uh, have to check if we are getting again the arithmetic exception because it can again overflow. If it does, we have to create a big integer. And the way how this is implemented is that the annotation process actually ge generates nodes for each of these methods for us. So based on which of the specializations, specializations is used, then they are added uh, to a chain uh, which, is represent which is then called uh, the execute methods are called on the chain, and then it, of course, goes through the partial evolutions and to the compilation. And this is also an example how we do a type specialization. So, for ex so if you use in your code only small integers, uh, only this the first method will be triggered for this, so it will end up compiled just as a single instruction for integer addition and one jump overflow if to check that. Uh, it didn't overflow. That's it. So that was the basics of Truffle. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how we optimize, how we do instance variable access, because we've seen seen it a lot in the uh, source code of the methods of the opcar benchmark. So the Ruby objects can grow and shrink, which means that a new instance variable can be added or removed from the object. 
So because of that, we, we use the following representation. We have a dynamic object, which is, uh, which is representing a Ruby object. And it has a few fields to store some values of instance variables. And it also has an array to store any additional instance variables, which are not fitting in these two few uh, fields. And the array, of course, then can be uh, grown or shrinked as needed. And uh, we have a companion object shape. Uh, assigned uh, from each uh, dynamic object, it describes where each instance variable is stored in the dynamic object. So uh, in the shape we can look up that, uh, for example, the name instance variable is stored at the certain offset in the dynamic object on the field too. So because of that, what we want to do is uh, we don't want to, each time we want to read an instance variable, we don't want to go through shape looking it up where it, is, where it is the actual instance and reading it. We want to somehow cache uh, where uh, we should read the instances, sorry, the values of the instance variables from. So this is again a small example how it looks like in our implementation. What it basically does is that as uh, if there is in a code a read from instance variable, at the beginning it's initialized, and then when it's first time it reads something, it caches the shape of the object it's is seen. Uh, and uh, it caches the shape and also the property which uh, stores uh, the offset in the dynamic object when the value is stored. And the shape and the property is uh, final. So. Uh, if I switch to a graphic representation, uh, we start with the initialized, then when we read uh, some, the, for example, instance variable name from an object, we cache that it has a, it had a shape with the instance variable name, and that uh, the property for describing the instance variable name uh, is cached as well, and within that uh, there is a uh, store the offset, the final offset well, of the value of the instance variable, which means that uh, next time when we are reading the value, we first just check that the shape of the dynamic object is equal to the cached uh, shape, which is very cheap. And if it does, we can immediately read the value from the final offset stored in the property. So we don't have to go through the shape and looking up the property when it, when it is stored and stuff like that. So uh, if we have very simple method, read, it just reads one instance variable. So we can then uh, have a look at uh, uh, a graph uh, of uh, IR, internal representation from Graal. This is a screenshot from the IGV. Uh, and uh, we can verify what I've just tried to explain on the previous slide. So at the beginning, uh, these nodes are just reading arguments from uh, given to the method, and this one is self. So if you follow the blue line, well, you cannot read it, so I have to explain it. Uh, this one just reads the shape, uh, and the blue one underneath it is comparing the shape it just read from the dynamic object with a constant value, which is part of the compiled code. So if this succeeds, it goes, it goes, I was, sorry. It goes here where it reads the value from the, uh, from the self object and uh, it uses this small gray rectangle is the final value, the offset where it's read from. But the real advantage is that if you have a uh, lot of uh, instance variables uh, in the method, like in this one, which is some zero page uh, mode for accessing memory from the benchmark, the checks for reading the instance variables are actually merged together. So again, this is just a subset of, uh, of the IGV graph. And you can see there is a matter, uh, there is a many 
uh, equal checks, which is all checking like the shape of the method is the one we are expecting. But this is actually after uh, one more pass, uh, optimizing pass in the Graal compiler is reduced to just three checks for the whole method. So the next, next thing is uh, splitting optimization. And uh, we will have a look at the, again at the source code for the CPU code. As you can notice, there are two sends method here in the add operation method. And this send method is uh, in our implementation represented as a tree of nodes, right? And if we had just uh, one tree for a send method, then uh, uh, we couldn't specialize for these different cases. We are calling the send method on different places and there may be different modes and instructions. The, it's calling different methods. So we want the, the call to send specialized differently in these two places. So for that we use uh, a two-dimensional polymorphic line cache. Uh, and uh, because actually, yeah, I have the example here. The front set method actually in this benchmark is called with uh, the with six different modes, and the uh, second send, which are which is calling the instructions, is uh, seven different instructions, which is which are represented by seven different methods. So we want to use the cache to specialize the two send, uh, sends uh, differently. So for that, we use splitting, and that means that we just take the original tree representing the body of the send method, having copied it, and have two copies of it. And the first one, having the cache, specializes for the first send, send node, and the second one specializes for the second send node. So let's have a look a little bit more how this works. So at the beginning, uh, there is again an initialized node in, inside the send uh, uh, tree, and uh, when the first method, when it's called with the first uh, method, it inserts one node which checks if it's uh, uh, apps, which is an like absolute uh, access mode. Then it checks that the receiver is clone type, which in this case is always CPU, but this is the second dimension. If it was some different uh, type of receiver, we would have another branch here. So if these two checks are correct, then it can directly call the abstract, uh, sorry, absolute method on a CPU. And as, uh, as different methods are called, the tree of the send method grows caching all the different methods they are called. And uh, this is again the representation from IGV. You can actually look at it, how it uh, was specialized for a given code. So in this case, you can almost read the names of the methods and, and the, uh, of the memory accesses. So splitting is applied to all methods, which is particularly important for the core methods, uh, like each uh, to string equal and stuff like that, which are called all over uh, the source code. So you have to you want these methods to be specialized in the places where you are calling them. Otherwise, you would have one tree for each method, and it would get megamorphic very quickly, which means it would not specialize for any particular case. It would be very generic, handling every call, every place where you are calling it. And uh, this is actually part of the Truffle framework. So it's not something we write directly in the Truffle Ruby implementation. This is something which is handled in the Truffle framework itself. And the second very important optimization is inlining. So now we have uh, splitted trees, uh, which are optimized for the different places uh, from uh, which they are called. But uh, if uh, these, uh, we, we had we looked at how the checks for the shapes are merged for the access to instance variables. So if you have, uh, for example, the op method, and it's calling the, some of the uh, memory access mode method, and then some of the instructions, both of these methods also have accesses to instance variables on the same object. So, but if, uh, 
But the methods, if they are not inline, that means that they are part of the different compilation unit. So the compiler cannot see the checks which are uh, done in the memory in one of the memory mode access methods uh, with the checks which which are in the one of the instructions. So it, they they cannot be merged together or eliminated. So for that, you need to inline the methods to uh, to the caller. So you get a bigger compilation unit to be able to eliminate these checks and guards, which is done very simply by just taking the tree for the, for let's say there was a immediate memory mode access. So you just take the tree which is representing the body of the method and you just copy it to the caller and that's it basically. Yeah, I basically already said that. Uh, again, this is part of the Truffle framework, so it's done in the Truffle framework, which means any language written on top of the Truffle framework will get uh, these optimizations. Uh, so uh, this means, for example, I've already mentioned it. If you uh, remember, I showed a little bit how we do the type specializations for f if we have the plus method on fixed num. This is uh, reduced just to two instructions after compilation, after inlining. Uh, but also, uh, the other consequence is that we can inline blocks, eliminate the overhead of, of blocks. Because blocks are uh, very good, very important abstractions in Ruby. They are uh, used very often. Uh, so it's good that we can allow developers to leave them in the code to keep the abstractions, but actually not paying the price uh, in performance. So for that, if we have a look at this. We, we compare, compare these uh, simple methods when the first one is the one we've already seen, just to read from instance variable. The second one does the same thing, but it's just wrapped in, wrapped, uh, in a block. So uh, These are the IGV graphs before the optimization passes for the two methods. Uh, and this is after the optimization. So as you can see, it's the same. The any overhead of the block, the allocation of the block, everything was eliminated. <coughs> so in conclusion, uh, what makes a Tafel Ruby run opt-carot benchmark nine times faster than MRI? It's not a single optimization, it's several things. And I didn't even cover everything, but just the major ones. So it's the splitting, inlining, and the partial evolutions, which allows you to eliminate uh, the overhead of uh, having the AST interpreter and a high quality compiler like, Gra like Graal, which allows us to produce high quality uh, machine code. And of course, we, we also do some optimization around uh, array access, which I didn't include it to do into this talk, which I, because I thought that I won't have the space. So just in a short, we, as we are able to specialize for uh, small integers, we are able to specialize arrays that if we see that a uh, user or some code is storing only integers, small integers into the array, we don't have to allocate an array of objects, we allocate just an array of ints of, primit of primitive values. So it also gives us some uh, performance benefits. Uh, I would like to acknowledge also all of the people which are working on the Graal, Truffle, and uh, uh, Truffle Ruby. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a research project. And that's it. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs> so we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Um, one of the things that uh, bothers me about, about Truffle Ruby is um, um, are you going to be able to use uh, m uh, most of the existing Java tooling uh, to work with it? For instance, can you use Visual VM with Truffle Ruby or something like that? Uh, question? Yeah, the question was if we are able to use existing tooling for uh, Java. Mm -hmm. And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, ba basic for example, the visual VM, I think there is some ongoing work to improve it so it won't profile just the Java parts of uh, 
the truffle and stuff like that, but it will actually understand a little bit uh, the languages uh, implemented on top of the truffle, so you can use it to actually inspect the languages uh, implemented in truffle, not just the Java. So, yeah, and we also have a uh, debugger, which is uh, independent on the uh, implementation, so you can debug, debug any language written uh, on top of Truffle. And because the debugger is independent, and because uh, the engine is polyglot, which means you can easily call one language implemented in Truffle uh, to another language uh, on top of Truffle, so we can, of course, debug it through calling different languages in one runtime. Thank you. Any more questions? Sure. So, when you're generating your two-dimensional inline cache, um, what kind of restrictions are you making on whether or not you're actually going to generate specializations, or do you just sort of wait to see how many things go through that? Uh, there is a limit. Uh, I didn't mention it. There is a in the, in the annotation. There is a. Sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Uh, the question was, uh, how do we deal uh, if, if there are any limits in the two-dimensional uh, cache? Uh, so, uh, it uh, there is a limit value on the annotation for the cache, and it says how big it can grow. After it uh, exceeds uh, the limit, the whole cache. You can configure it. You either can uh, the whole cache uh, throw away and replace it with one generic node, which always knows how to call any method, or you can keep the current cache uh, at the bottom, append the generic uh, node which handles uh, any other calls. Uh, Currently, uh, you need uh, a JVM with uh, JMCI uh, uh, API. So uh, Growl is uh, so you can use Growl. There is a build of uh, Java 8 with it. Uh, Java 9 will have it uh, when it's released, so it won't be any problem in Java 9. Uh, but uh, there is also another project, uh, Substrate VM, which uh, basically ahead of time precompiles the whole implementation of the language including t uh, Truffle and Graal. Uh, so on one hand you lose uh, Java part, on the other hand because it's precompiled we get uh, the startup time to around 100 uh, milliseconds which is quite close to MRI. So the hello world is just uh, 100 milliseconds. Follow-up question. Uh, since you were mentioning Substrate VM, one thing I haven't understood is um, when you go from the normal Java VM to uh, Substrate, what do you lose? Uh, because it's ahead of time compiled, so during that time it analyzes all of the parts which are used from the Java uh, standard library, and it compiles ahead of time only the parts which are used. Uh, and during the time also takes as certain assumptions that it can do, it does a global analysis. So it can see, okay, this method with, uh, with this name was called, is always called on this particular receiver. And because it's called ahead of time, you cannot go back from this assumption. So we have to forbid uh, class loading, uh, loading and other Java classes which could break this assumption. So for example, for on a substrate VM, you cannot load new Java classes because of this. But it's not entirely true because there might be also a Java on Truffle and then it will be able to... So you, okay. you, miss, you also lose some of the things from Hotspot, right? Like the GC or something like that? No, no, no. It's, uh, the, the, because, yeah, right. It's a different VM, so it has a different GC. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, Peter. Thank you.